social distancing, you say? The future is watching. Welcome to Opcode Virtual Summit. Thank you, Matt, and um, thanks everybody for staying uh, through this very interesting discussion. Uh, there was a lot of talk about uh, this information, and uh, now we're going to talk a bit about uh, the opposite, which is information. In particular, uh, we're going to talk a bit about, uh, you know, how to know more about the things which are happening in your network at home. And actually, um, the idea for this talk, um, it came to me in uh, 2016 in January when uh, Rob Joyce, who used to be the head of the uh, tailored access operations group at uh, the NSA, uh, I think that he uh, moved on since to other positions, but he made a speech at the uh, Usenix uh, Enigma conference. And he said um, something very interesting that a lot of people um, already knew, but I guess that this was uh, quite interesting confirmation of uh, what we knew. And he said, I quote, one of our worst nightmares is that out of band network tab that is really capturing all the data, understanding anomalous behavior that's going on and someone paying attention to it. So you gotta know your network, understand your network because we are going to. Now, this was rather interesting uh, from several points of view. In particular for me, it was interesting because um, about, uh, I guess maybe four or five months uh, uh, before his talk, actually, I started tapping my home internet very much in the same way through an out of band network tap. And well, what does it mean? Uh, well, in terms of network OPSEC, speaking from 2020, work from home, everybody is pretty much, uh, I guess, stuck at home unless you guys are living in Sweden or Belarus or other countries which have, uh, may, let's say, non-orthodox policy where it comes to social isolation. So as we're spending more and more time at home, um, maybe I would say it's interesting for you and for everybody to spend some time as well looking at your network traffic. And there's actually quite, let's say, a few good reasons for that. Now, uh, speaking about the basics, um, and uh, let's say thread modeling, let's say, let's think a bit about uh, who are, let's say, the actors that you need to worry about. Well, the low profile actors are generally not a threat. So they will not be able to fish you or steal your credentials or maybe exploit you with a two, three, five years old uh, exploit because I guess everybody is by now patched. Um, on the other hand, pretty much all high profile actors, if they want, they can very easily infect you. And it's just a matter of cost justification. So if they can justify, let's say, spending half a million dollars or one or $2 million uh, on zero days and using those zero days uh, on you, then you, I, I would say that's pretty much uh, very little that you can do to stop them. So. Our assumption and objectives here would be that uh, we are or will be infected, that this is just a fact and we can't stop it um, because again, it's just a matter of cost justification. And when this happens, what we actually want, we want to catch it. Now, remember that the infection is a matter of cost and what we wanna do, we'll try to increase the cost of, as much as possible. And the other thing to keep in mind is that routine is the opposite of security. So actually we want to keep changing our OPSEC, always adapting to the latest trends. And this is uh, one of the things that I am doing myself in case you're wondering. So today I'm just gonna speak about point number one. And uh, well, if I don't mess up things badly, maybe Matt will invite me in the future to speak about the other two points. But nevertheless, today, we want to speak just about point number one, which is how to monitor your home internet for APTs. Now, the reality is that the harder requirements for this task are, let's say, not that uh, complicated. So what we need obviously is an Ethernet internet 
uh, it will be difficult, way more difficult to monitor fiber optic internet, but Ethernet internet can be quite easily monitored. And we'll need a hub or a smart switch, and we'll need a mini, mini PC for this purpose as well. Now, for the Ethernet hub, uh, you can still find them uh, on eBay. Well, the sad part here is that uh, you can't purchase them new anymore. I don't think that you can find this anymore. Uh, still, you can find them on eBay for $10, $15. Uh, and keep in mind that the hub is not the same as a switch. A hub will just mirror the traffic through all the ports and uh, we're gonna take advantage of that to monitor the internet traffic. Now, of course, I know what some of you will say. Uh, you'll say that uh, we have gigabit at home and don't worry, I've got you covered. Instead of a hub, you can actually use a smart switch. Tick switch for about uh, $40. Uh, this is a gigabit switch with management. Uh, it is available pretty much everywhere. And there's also another option here, a Netgear switch, uh, which uh, pretty much can accomplish the same thing. So you want the smart managed versions of these routers, which have the ability to do port mirroring. So we're gonna use port mirroring to replicate the internet traffic. Now for the mini PC, um, you can either use something like an Intel NUC, maybe you can convince Ryan Narain to send you a free NUC, um, I haven't, and or you can use a maybe Raspberry Pi uh, version four, which are quite powerful and quite cheap in my opinion. Um, optional, you can also use an USB network card. And why do you need that? Well, we may want to do both tap and access into the mini PC. So uh, this way, of course, uh, you can connect the mini PC to your internal network, but then it will not be out of band anymore. Me personally, I, I have, uh, let's say, very good experience using both uh, Edimax and Anchor adapters, which are like $10, $15. So the whole setup, uh, I would say, costs between $150 and maybe $400. So this is what we have. Uh, the internet goes in through the hub. The hub replicates one port into your Wi Fi router, another port goes into your mini PC. And then again, you can, uh, if you want, uh, you'll reduce the security a bit by doing it so, but it's maybe more convenient. Again, it will not be out of band anymore, but you can connect a USB Ethernet adapter to the mini PC back into the router, and then you can just log in, in there to see what's going on. Now, for the mini PC, I run uh, Linux and uh, Suricata version 3 plus because we want uh, the DNS log from Suricata. You want to enable DNS log, HTTP log, and the fast log with extended formats. Uh, you want to enable TLS log. And I personally disable stat log, which just uh, you know fills the disk. Uh, for NetFlow, you can use PMACCTD. Um, and if you're really paranoid and have a lot of disk space, I guess you can uh, also just TCP dump. Um, pretty much everything. So one idea could be, for instance, not port 443, because dumping port 443 might not be uh, very productive or useful. Uh, one of the issues here is that, for instance, uh, streaming platforms like Netflix or I don't know, HBO Go, they use port 80 for that. So you're gonna, if you're gonna watch, let's say some um, 4K movies, uh, you will fill your hard drive very quickly. Um, what do the logs look like? These are the kind of logs that um, Suricata produces. Uh, what you see here is a DNS log. You see a couple of queries. You see a couple of um, responses. Um, I personally, I process these DNS logs into a much, uh, let's say, easier to work uh, with format in which we have a timestamp, we have the host, and we have the respective IP resolution um, for that. And this, um, I well process in many different ways by, and you can obviously do the same. Um, for instance, maybe one of the easiest things to do um, is shown here by this bash script. You can just uh, take the logs, um, you can extract the DNS queries from uh, uh, the last couple of days or the yeah, last day, and then you can just make uh, a top of the DNS queries and uh, email them to you just to get an idea of how many queries are happening per day from your home. 
And there's, of course, many other uh, ideas. Um, there's also, let's say, an improvement. The first improvement to this uh, method would be uh, to have the network tap and then to have some IOCs that you can also check on the network traffic. And for instance, you can take a bunch of IOCs and can try to match them against the network traffic. Uh, my recommendation would be to match them both on the actual traffic and going back a couple of months uh, just in case, because sometimes you get IOCs and uh, those IOCs are related to something which happened uh, in the past. Um, and together, this can also prove uh, quite useful. Now, there's even more improvements uh, that you can do. Some of the things that I am doing myself um, uh, in terms of heuristics, for instance, would be a TLS certificates, uh, TLS connections, SSL certificates analysis. Uh, for instance, looking for connections um, associated with hosts which have self-signed certificates. Um, and this can be a very good uh, giveaway of traffic that shouldn't be there. Um, DNS queries frequency is another thing you can do. For instance, uh, look for some kind of a pattern. You can apply for real transforms and find the DNS queries which happen regularly such as maybe every hour or maybe every six hours, uh, well, and so on and so on. Another thing to search for would be unusual domains, uh, things like, uh, you know, .pw or .cf or .tk. And there's a lot of these free um, uh, domains out there, uh, pretty much similar to dynamic DNS uh, providers, which are also quite interesting to spot in the traffic. So all this, uh, are likely to boost your detection capabilities. And then uh, other ideas could be, um, for instance, uh, net flow analysis, extracting the top traffic IPs, uh, doing a whois lookup on them and just uh, flagging them for inspection. Uh, I do this regularly and uh, I filter out things like uh, the Netflix IPs, um, like uh, all the other streaming uh, IPs, uh, and what is left, obviously, whenever you see a spike in there, that requires some additional inspection. Now, all of this, I know it sounds quite nice, uh, uh, but yeah, what, what can you find with this? And uh, you guys are gonna say, um, you know, uh, show us uh, the money, show us what you found with it. So yeah, let me show you what I call case number one that was spotted by this technology. Um, I was like one day, you see that actually it was uh, quite a long time ago, um, 2014, uh, I was looking at my DNS logs and I spotted a suspicious looking um, host name, sachex.info or sachex.info. And if you look at the timestamps, um, you will probably notice that this is kind of happening regularly, almost like um, every hour. So what we have here, like uh, 11 p.m., midnight, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m., and so on. So this is pretty much uh, what I was talking about. This is the case of something which is being queried once per hour, like regularly with maybe some jitter correction. So it's not always on the same minute. So I started uh, looking into this just to understand the first thing. Uh, if I looked into the who is record of these hosts, uh, and I noticed there are some Gmail, like pretty generic Gmail addresses associated with this 310 crescent at Gmail, Robert Statica at Gmail. Uh, couldn't find, let's say, anything interesting on it. Uh, so I did a bit more digging. I tried to connect there on HTTPS. Uh, there's a blank page nothing to see. Um, doing a bit more digging, if you look into the certificate, uh, the certificate uh, is also pretty generic. Uh, there's no organization uh, in there. Well, it's issued by uh, GoDaddy, it was valid for one year. So at this point, you can imagine that I became quite suspicious and I, I, let's say I was quite confident that I caught something that shouldn't be in there. This shouldn't be my network traffic. Um, also, by just Googling for setchecks.info, uh, you 
back then you wouldn't find much. So there was like pretty much nothing uh, in there. So I decided just to block it uh, because I control my own DNS server. Maybe we can talk about this uh, uh, another time, how to set up your own uh, blocking DNS using PyHole and various blocking lists. But I just blocked it for um, my uh, home network. And then, you know, uh, I kind of uh, suspiciously discovered that uh, also the amount of queries that I was getting, they were more or less matching what appeared to be some kind of a pattern. So if you look into this graphic, uh, which is by hours, you notice that the amount of connections is lower between maybe 12 and 6, 7 p.m. And to be honest, I, I was wondering why that is the case. So keep looking. I, uh, it's actually making these queries. Um, funny thing is uh, that when I started counting the amount of devices in my home network, um, I reached a funny number of about 34 different devices connected uh, to the internet. So that includes like uh, a bunch of uh, smart TVs, tablets, uh, mobile phones, uh, network attached storages, uh, smart watches, and so on and so on. 34 different devices were connected. But uh, well, what was going on here, obviously, the amount of queries was smaller between one and six. And actually that was the time when I was uh, mostly in the office. And I realized that this is likely something that I'm taking with me to the office. So doing a bit more digging, I was able to find what it was. This was actually an app called Wicker that I was using back then, um, which stopped working actually after I blocked Sechex or sesex.info in my DNS server. Uh, kind of mystery solved, I would say, it still gave me a bit of a panic um, as uh, it wasn't, I would say, very obvious. That was, it wasn't like a communication to weaker.com or even weaker.info. It was just to this uh, shady sesex.info domain with no who is or registration information about it. Yeah, um, well, case number two. So again, all this, uh, to be honest, I found them not by scripting, but I found them by just looking at the logs. If you remember what Rob Joyce was saying, someone paying attention to the logs can sometimes be quite powerful. So, as I was looking through the HTTP logs this time, I noticed that again, exactly every hour, you said like 338, 438, 538, 639. So there's like a very small delay and so on and so on. Every hour, there's an HTTP connection to an IP address. There's no host name here. So there was nothing in the DNS logs. And the path is something CGI being client CGI and some serial or indicator and the user agent was WGA. So again, something very shady happening every hour. Um, well, this, I would say was also very, very suspicious. So I started digging uh, the connections were all to port 8,000. So I probed the host a bit just to see what's in the air. Um, it was basically uh, in South Korea, uh, the generic uh, KRNYC network. Uh, so not much, not much you can uh, discover from this, like who is actually uh, behind this IP address and the traffic uh, happening in your home. And spawning, let's say, into the traffic, uh, um, well, I was able to find the reason for that. And uh, well, it was a network attached storage, an extremer not network attached storage that I purchased a couple of uh, years ago. And I'm no longer using it, just in case you're wondering. What is interesting about this uh, network attached storage is that this function, this beam beaming to um, their, one of their command and control servers actually had a buffer overflow in it. So uh, with my uh, 
colleague Vitaly Kamluk, we reversed engineered the binary that was doing this traffic uh, on the NAS was running from Crown Hourly. And they were actually reading uh, data from a um, network socket onto a uh, buffer located on the stack that had a fixed size of about 200 bytes. So like super, super easy to exploit uh, for somebody who wanted, if they wanted, and they had access to the network traffic. Not to mention that uh, this could have been exploited very easily uh, uh, by the, obviously, by the uh, owners of this server. And there's, I know there's a, a question uh, from Dave um, in the chat. Hey, Dave, hope you're all doing fine. Thanks for joining the, this uh, uh, opcode op uh, call. Um, uh, how many implants uh, actually add jitter to bypass statistical analysis of this type? Like uh, every hour plus minus rand of 30. Actually, I'd be surprised that uh, there are quite a few, um, especially there's quite a few of them when we speak about high-end APTs. So all high-end APTs uh, actually do that they do add this jitter. And we've seen um, quite funny cases when, uh, let's say the developers from a certain APT, uh, they prefer, let's say, a very specific type of jitter. And by just looking for that jitter code alone, you can find more of their implants. So on one hand, obviously this can bypass or fool the statistical analysis on the other one. Uh, on the other hand, it can be helpful to catch the implants themselves. Um, yeah, so next time, I think, um, again, as I said, if Matt uh, wants to have me again, we can talk a bit about increasing the cost, uh, complicating targeting and uh, exploitation, which I guess are the next steps. Pretty much, uh, I guess, getting more visibility is the pretty much the most basic step that you can take uh, when you want to, uh, uh, let's say, to do a bit better. Just if you care about OPSEC, if you care about yourself getting attacked, the, the most basic step is to- Just for the record, you're welcome uh, to come back on anytime. your home internet. And in reality, you don't know what's uh, flowing through your home internet link unless you tap it. Um, so I've been tapping my home internet now for um, about six years, I guess. And I can tell you that it can be done very uh, easily with a relatively simple, harder configuration. Uh, a lot of people are scared about doing this uh, in the sense, oh, we need to install Linux and we need to buy a hub. And uh, well, I can tell you that it can be done. I've been trying to convince Ryan the rain for many years uh, to do this for his home still trying to convince him maybe one of these days uh, will be able to do it but uh, i can guarantee that this offers a huge level of defense and awareness whenever there's some new report out there uh, whenever kaspersky semantic trend micro whoever he said uh, you name it they published a new report about some significant threat, you can just take those indicators and then you search them back against your DNS logs, HTTP logs, NetFlow. And you can very easily say if you have ever been affected by that threat or not. So far, I was not uh, able to find any APT attacks on my network. That doesn't mean, of course, that I've never been uh, attack. I uh, honestly, I do operate on the principle that my computer is owned by at least three APTs. So I try to combine, uh, let's say, having different computers, uh, having decoys, sometimes putting information there on the machine uh, designed to uh, deceive an attacker which has access or just to, uh, well, trigger a number of alarms and alerts. And one last thing that I would like to mention um, is that when you elevate the cost of SIGINT, remember that you will become a target for human. And that's pretty much all I have for today. Happy hunting and I hope you guys uh, stay safe.
both uh, in the cyber realm and against the uh, invisible enemy. Thanks, uh, Kostin. Uh, I, I just realized after I was uh, on mute on Zoom, but uh, you're more than welcome uh, to come back uh, anytime. And, uh, <laughs> apparently, uh, I mean, uh, we, we, we'll confirm after, but uh, it sounds like Ryan wants to uh, host and moderate uh, the next uh, fireside chat, and uh, you would be speaking with, uh, with Dev if he's accepting. So that should be uh, quite interesting. <laughs> we, 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 we all know that uh, Ryan is a great moderator, so that should be uh, quite cool. Uh, yeah, I don't know if the chat has any more question. At some point, uh, Dragos made a comment. He said you should use so Dualcom ETAP 2003 and uh, two non real tech uh, USB free Ethernet adapters. So I don't <laughs> know if you can uh, say more about that uh, in the chat, but uh, yeah, that sounded uh, that sounded interesting. Although I don't know any of those devices, so we'll not be able to comment on that. Well, the, yeah. Um... A uh, shark tap is also a good choice. Um, I guess that the uh, old fashioned uh, hardware hub, so the hub that just does the uh, electronic uh, port mirroring is probably the safest uh, solution. Indeed, um, using smart switches can be tricky, uh, especially some of them get an IP address by the HCP. So there's absolutely like a quite a few tricky issues there, but the old fashioned uh, hardware hub <laughs> is the way to go for me. So uh, yeah, a qu qu uh, question from the chat. So you never found any a APT? Uh, in my home, I in my home, again, I'm tapping my home. So in my home, I never found any APT. Uh, obviously, we found quite a few APTs in, in other places, but at least in my home, I haven't found any. So far, so far. This doesn't mean, again, that I haven't been hit. It just means that I need to work better at catching some. Yeah, I mean, like, that's uh, my, my following uh, question with that is, uh, since um, everyone is working from home now, like, have you seen any, like, changes and in, uh, in terms of, like, uh, the behavior of attackers? Because it does make sense now for attackers to actually target, like, people's home since uh well everyone is working from home right home is the office like when the oh. bring your own device was a big like po polemic no it's even worse it's like literally like working from home um well i guess that uh, the amount the overall amount of attacks um they're kind of now increasing so in particular when you look at attacks uh, related to things like uh, covid uh, keywords, uh, then the number has been increasing uh, a lot since the beginning of uh, March. Yeah, that's probably when the uh, spike began. Um, another thing was that we were uh, uh, kind of thinking that uh, probably a Zoom zero day, a Zoom remote zero day would now be priceless for a lot of attackers. Yeah. Uh, imagine what can be accomplished uh, with that. So I'm also looking forward uh, to the next talk, speaking about uh, Zoom security. The next, sub um, next update from Zerodium on their table. <laughs> yeah, I, I wonder if Zerodium will, will push a uh, an update or notification in regards to uh, Zoom zero days. That would be interesting to see. I can happens. always try to uh, invite uh, Shaoki for the next uh, roundtable uh, between uh, you and David. Uh, maybe we'd accept. <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> yeah, I doubt so, but that would be uh, funny. Uh, another question from the chat. Uh, one from Dave. If your house is in Moscow, uh, another one is a quick and dirty config to run uh, three catalogs through the free CTI. Um, so the first one home is in Moscow. No, actually, I'm based in Bucharest. Uh, I'm Romanian and I've been living in Bucharest uh, all my life. I've been to Moscow quite a few times, to be honest. Uh, um, it's beautiful. There are a lot of beautiful things to visit if you're into arts. Um, nevertheless, uh, my home is in Bucharest. And uh, let me see, what was the other question? About is there Surika? quick and dirty config to run uh, Surikata logs through uh, FreeCTI? 
Is there a quick and dirty config to run Suricata through FreeCTI? I can't say, to be honest, because I I just built uh, all my uh, parsers myself, all the Suricata parsing and heuristics, I build them myself, so I can't say if, uh, if there's a quick and dirty way for that. Mm. And well, the follow-up question for that was like, does that make sense to do? Uh, it would just be too noisy. Um, I can't say again, uh, but I would say that the way to go forward is just a lot of uh, experimenting. So mm. I didn't know what uh, what kind of heuristics to build when I uh, started doing this. Um, it was all, you know, by ex experimenting, uh, looking at the logs with the naked eye and then trying to build heuristics based on um, the observations and what looked suspicious in the logs. Uh, another question from Yan. Uh, what's your opinion on using the following tools? Suricata for the IDS and uh, some IOCs and Zeek for network security monitoring and Rita for threat hunting in a home environment. What would be the hardware specs? Um, can so you do that with an Intel NUC, I guess? <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Like, um, to be honest, the last, the most uh, recent generation of Intel NUCs uh, is uh, quite powerful. So uh, you can get one with an i7 uh, CPU. Um, well, obviously, you'll have to invest. I guess the uh, investment would be something in the range of 1,000 uh, bucks for the uh, i7 NUC and memory plus uh, an uh, SSD, um, but again, I think it's a very worth investment. Uh, it will absolutely work. I can tell you that um, this also depends a lot on the network speed. So do you have a gigabit uh, network connection? Do you have a 100 megabits? Uh, if you have a 100 megabits, uh, you can do these things uh, even with a cheaper hardware, such as uh, maybe a, like a, a generic uh, 100 or 200 dollars uh, mini PC you can get on Amazon will handle uh, 100 megabit traffic without problems. But if you want to do real time gigabit uh, pattern matching uh, with Suricata, then you'll need the uh, high-end Intel NUC. Maybe we can get uh, Intel to uh, give away some uh, NUC uh, for the next edition. That would be a, a, a nice thing so we can build uh, some uh, home lab uh, to start tapping our homes. <laughs> I'm absolutely for you. And uh, yeah, um, anything you want to add, uh, Kostin? I'm just checking if there is more questions. I don't see any more questions so far. Um, oh, yeah, uh, Jeremy says uh, about uh, endpoint monitoring oh, yeah. uh, OS query. Oh, well, yeah, that's a brilliant idea. Of course, um, you want to collect logs from uh, all the endpoints that you have in the home. What I'm doing, I'm collecting both sys logs on the Unix and uh, Mac OS machines, and then I'm, connect I'm collecting uh, uh, sysmon logs from the Windows machines. Uh, it's very good just to collect, store them somewhere. Uh, if at some point you get compromised, uh, then you have information that you can sift through in order to find when it happened, how it happened, uh, what triggered the attack, uh, all these key elements which can help you figure out exactly uh, what's going on and how you got compromised. Uh, I think we have another question also. Uh I have another non-relevant question for Kostin from uh, Dave. Does he see a particular movement towards different protocols for C2, aka is DNS tunneling common or only HTTPS? Or dot, dot, dot. Um, well, uh, first of all, I want to say that Dave is asking all the right questions. So obviously he knows what he's talking about when asking these particular questions. I'm not, not sure just if the like right the dot, question. dot, dot is like the actual question <laughs> or if it's before. Uh, got it. But yeah, we, uh, we're seeing, we're seeing um, um, some, let's say, interesting protocols uh, such as DNS tunneling. Yeah, there's a number of APT groups like, uh, for instance, uh, oil rig or muddy water who like uh, DNS tunneling nowadays. Uh, you know, the plain old HTTPS is probably still a favorite. Uh, mm. Passive backdoors uh, are also kind of, uh, let's say, interesting. So when we speak about the truly high-end uh, threat actors out there, uh, they all 
kind of um, stand up for some, let's say, uh, particular features. So uh, one of them can be uh, passive backdoors. So for instance, passive backdoors that react to ICMP traffic or UDP traffic or even uh, HTTP traffic. So imagine dropping such a passive backdoor onto a web server and then doing all the CNS um, communication with the backdoor through HTTP requests into that uh, machine. Uh, but I would say that pretty much all the high-end actors are uh, have all sorts of tools in their toolboxes uh, that use additional protocols, um, even if HTTPS is probably still the most popular choice. Even HTTP is still a popular choice, but yeah, we do see uh, UDP-based communications. Uh, um, I'll give you another example. Recently, we did a, um, a red teaming uh, uh pen testing exercise and uh, we decided to use uh, wireguard um, which is a quite interesting uh, modern vpn but it can also be used in a very sneaky way together with a raspberry pi uh, just to drop something into uh, a network uh, with the wireguard vpn it can be quite tricky to spot uh, if you don't know what to to look for uh yeah another follow-up question what's the weirdest protocol uh, use you have seen so far um what's the weirdest protocol uh, well i i would say there's maybe not necessarily the weirdest but what's in my opinion the hardest to catch is uh tor based command and control so there's a couple of vectors out there um, um which use uh, a Tor-based CNC mechanism. So in that case, you just need to have a method of um, spotting Tor traffic from your home. And if you if you use Tor yourself, so if Tor is, let's say, legitimate traffic, then it can be extremely, extremely difficult to uh, identify a backdoor communicating uh, by Tor in your network. But yeah, there's, of course, there's a lot of exotic things out there. Um, there's probably many stories and there's many things we can uh, talk about here. I don't know if you have time, so maybe this is a good uh, uh, question to answer the next time we speak about uh, OPSEC and increasing the cost of exploitation. Well, that's a good question for Arian uh, to mark down for the next uh, fire chat, you know, for in two weeks. <laughs> Since uh, apparently Dev uh, says like two weeks is not enough to prepare like uh, slides for a keynote. <laughs> uh, another question: What's Suricata Beacon? Uh, what uh, Suricata Beaconing detection techniques are on your top list? Except time patterns and protocol abuse. Um, yeah, like I said, um, analysis of the um, uh, SSL certificates can be quite uh, productive in uh, spotting connections to, let's say, unusual places. Obviously, I don't want to give away all my tricks uh, because I'm pretty yeah. sure the, the APTs are listening. So <laughs> the APTs are in the chat. <laughs> tomorrow, <laughs> they will uh, just simply uh, adjust uh, all their techniques uh, in order to avoid uh, the things that I'm talking about. So obviously, this is something which I uh, already assumed when I put together this talk. Um, so yeah, with, without talking about everything, I would say uh, the SSL certificate analysis, uh, looking for traffic anomalies, um, um, pretty much all sorts of uh, protocol anomalies that you can search for and unusual protocols such as ICMP, UDP, they are uh, in my, let's say, top three, top five. Cool. Uh, well, uh, thanks again for joining us, uh, Kostin. It was a real pleasure to have you and a uh, really you. interesting talk. And, uh, Thank you, man. I hope uh, Ryan is going to manage to convince uh, both you and Dave uh, for the fire uh, side chat for uh, the third edition of that uh, virtual conference. That should be fun. And uh, yeah, well, uh, f f thanks again, Kostin. Yeah, cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye. Cheers. Take Bye. care, everyone.